Sunday Laws and the End Time. Ellen White penned a very interesting statement in the 1800s, in 1888, when the Sunday Law Movement was moving along in America. And she said some things that I think are more relevant and applicable now to us uh, because of the movements that are being made now. I would like to start with the two statements that she mentioned, and then I will get into what I wanted to start with you this morning. We have been looking for many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And now that movement is right upon us. We ask, what are the people going to do in the matter? We should especially seek God for grace and power to be given his people now. God lives, and we do not believe that the time has fully come when he would have our liberties restricted. So in 1800s, when the Sunday law movement was being pushed, she said, we should especially seek God for grace and power to be given to his people now. I believe that there is now time to seek God for his grace and power so that we'll be able to stand for during the coming crisis. This is the last one. I would like to read from those statements. Rear and Herald, um, Extra, December 11, 1888. She says, the Sunday movement is now making its way in the darkness. The leaders are concealing their true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. They are working in blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation, and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusions, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. There are many people advocating Sunday as a rest day now all over the world, but they don't know where this is going to lead. And uh, this morning we're going to study more on these particular issues. I want to take you through a history of Sunday law so that we can appreciate better what is happening now. We're going to analyze the first Sunday law that was ever enacted by Constantine in AD 321 and the further developments of Sunday laws that came afterwards, and the different phases or stages of Sunday laws that we find in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, and how that is affecting us in our time. So let's go back into history, and this is a very famous Sunday law that as Seventh-day Adventists we know very well, that was enacted by Constantine in AD 321. And uh, you can find this uh, from ancient church history. Uh, Joseph Cullen Aya is the one that wrote it. He says, all judges, this was how the first Sunday law read, all judges and city people and their craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. Country people, however, may freely attend to the cultivation of the fields because it frequently happens that no other day are better adapted for planting the grain in the furrows or in the vines in the trenches, so that the advantage given by heavenly providence may not for the occasion of a short time perish. As you read this, I have a question for you. Does this first Sunday law say anything about going to church on Sunday? No. Does it say anything about worshiping on Sunday? Does it say anything about not going to church on Sabbath? No, we don't see that at all. And uh, what was the motivation behind this Sunday law? This law, as we see, was written by Constantine in AD 321. But what was the real motivation behind it? Uh, let me just uh, read to you what uh, other historians have found. This is A.T. Jones in the book that he has written, Sunday Legislation, page 4, paragraph 1. There should be a suspension of business at the courts and in other civil offices so that the day might be devoted with less interruption to the purposes of what? Devotion. So the first Sunday law's motive was religious, although the law itself had nothing to do with religion. When, Sir, when Constantine enacted it, Ellen White makes it clear that it was to please the bishops because they tried to persuade him to enact the Sunday law. It was in order to please the bishops as well as to bring about unity in his empire. Because you had the pagans keeping Sunday and then you had the Christians keeping the true Sabbath Saturday. And then his empire was about to split. There was a conflict 
And one of the issues that he was brought across was if we could have uh, a Sunday as a day of rest, I'm going to please the pagans because that's the day they keep, and I'm also going to bring around along all these bishops that have been pushing me for a Sunday law. And initially when it started, you had the Sabbath and Sunday both days being kept. And the summer day was kept and there was declared a day of fasting where you should not eat anything. And then Sunday was also respected, but it was a day of eating. Now, naturally speaking, if you have two days, the other day was a day of fasting, the other day of feasting. Which one would you choose? The feasting day. So that's, that, that's naturally the human nature. So we find here that as time progressed, Constantine legalized the first Sunday law and its own motive was religious. It was not just a secular law. This first Constantine law of 8321 did not end here. The bishops that were pleased with the first step that Constantine uh, enacted did not stop just at that first Sunday law. We find this in Inyanda's History of the Church, page 300. He says, those older changes effected by Emperor Constantine were rigorously enforced. And in general, civil transactions of every kind on Sunday were strictly forbidden. Whoever transgressed was to be guilty, was to be considered in fact as guilty of sacrilege. So one thing that we notice here is that the first Sunday law said, people that are in the big cities should not work, but those in the country can work. Then the next phase of the Sunday law here in 83 to 86, was that uh, civil transactions of every kind, whether in the country or in the city, had to be stopped. So do you see a progression? The first one was just restricting work in the big cities, in the big businesses, and now the, this one is restricting all kinds of work wherever it is. That's what happened. So as a result of this particular law that was uh, enacted in 386 AD, Something happened. Idleness increased. People were idle. They were not supposed to work on Sunday. So what would they do? Sit idle. And you know the common English saying, the idle mind is the workshop of who? Yeah. Of the devil. So the devil was busy working. So immorality increased. There was a lot of crime as a result of this. And other business-minded people started thinking of other plans of entertaining the people. So they started circuses, they started theaters where people could go and receive entertainment. There was no work on Sunday and you could go and entertain yourself. So a lot of people went out to these theaters, a lot of people went out to the circuses to get entertainment during this time. So the bishops were not happy. They were not only happy with the fact that people were not supposed to work on Sunday, but they were not happy that people did not go to church. You know, at this time, you know the famous St. Augustine, who studied the doctrine of persecution in the Catholic Church. He argued that God gave two sorts to the Christian church. You have the sword of the spirit, and then you have the sword of steel. You know, he believes that men have to be led to worship God by the sword of the spirit, the Bible. But if this means fail, then another means have to be employed. If we cannot convert them with the Bible, then let's convert them with the steel, the sword of steel. Let's persecute them into the kingdom of God. And he read such verses that we find in Luke chapter 14, verse 32, where Christ was saying, compel them to come. And Augustine developed the doctrine of persecution that has been used by the Catholic Church to justify what they've been doing during the time of the 1,260 years of its reign. So at this particular time, the bishop said, well, we tried to compel the people to come to church by giving them a day off on Sundays, and they did not come. Instead, immorality increases. Instead, they are gathering to circuses. Instead, they are increasing immorality. So we now need to employ the principle of persecution by Constantine. So they now try to compel the government to try and force everyone to go to church on Sunday. And in 421, they started a petition. It's called the Carthage uh, Petition, where they had a convention in Carthage, the city of Carthage, and they signed the petition, and they wanted to compel the government to force everyone to worship on Sunday. 
And this convention, Catholic Convention of 421 AD, yielded fruit. The government finally yielded in 425 AD. This petition of the Catholic Convention could not be granted at once, but in 425, the desired law was secure. And to this also, there was a test arisen that was given for the first Sunday law that was ever made, namely, that the, in order that the devotion of the faithful might be free from all disturbance. Very, very interesting. The rights of the people, A.T. Jones, page 221. Very, very interesting reason that is given. 425, everyone is compelled to go to church. The reason that is given is that people that are working in the circuses instead of going to church, they are being persecuted by being employed to work on Sunday right here in their circuses. And some of them who are working, they said it's persecution to have people working on Sunday instead of going to church on Sunday. And others said, well, if other people are working outside and I'm worshiping God, it's disturbing my worship. Let me ask you a question. If people now are working, some of them are working out in the railroad, some of them are working in roads construction, others are just into house construction, do they disturb your worship here? Are they a cause of disturbance to your worship? No, but the bishops believe that you are, you are disturbing their worship on Sunday if you are working. So instead of, uh, they said that uh, the circuses were competing with the church, and the circuses were leading many people to hell. So um, these people were supposed now to be compelled to come into the Christian church, whether they liked it or not. So what we notice here is the progression of Sunday laws. The first one we saw was 321 AD, that one that we famously know, the Sunday closing law. This law was basically saying that businesses should close on Sunday, but they could still give other people opportunities to run their workshops on Sunday. And during this time in AD 321, you could still go to church on Sabbath, and there would not be any issues. You could still keep the Sabbath day of the Lord very well, but you're not allowed to open your business on Sunday in 321 AD. But the bishops were not happy with just restricting people to not open businesses on Sunday. The Sunday law progressed in 386 AD to a point where they said, okay, you may not be going to church on Sunday, but you need to respect Sunday. You are not allowed to do anything on Sunday. You're not allowed to mow your lawn. You're not allowed to do your laundry. You're not allowed to work anywhere else. You need to stay at home on Sunday and respect Sunday. You cannot desecrate the Lord's Day. And uh, coupled with this, if you read the book Great Controversy, Ellen White states that the bishops started appealing to man's superstition. There was one man that they claimed was trying to work. He had an ax and was trying to chop wood and the axe stuck to his hand, it would not go on Sunday. So they started appealing to superstition to bring about the desired effect of the law. So civil transaction of every kind was forbidden, 386 AD, and then in 8425, people were now compelled to worship on Sunday. Whether they were Christian or not, you were compelled to worship on Sunday. So, and then in 538, we know the famous year when the papacy received political power uh, from Emperor Justinian. The papacy takes power and uh, the righteous are being persecuted during this time and then you have the death decree. So what I've taken you through is a history of the first Sunday law that was ever enacted. That the first Sunday law was developed in stages. It did not just start with worship on Sunday. There was a progression of steps that Satan took over different types of years, over or almost two centuries, Satan was developing this concept of Sunday law until it finally was ready for the people to accept it. So I believe the same thing is happening even in our time. Now we have analyzed the first Sunday law that was ever enacted then, and now we want to look at uh, how this Sunday law came to America. Remember that uh, the papacy was ruling in Europe, and then you have the Anglican Church that broke away from the Catholic Church. Um, and then with that particular concept, 
the concept of Sunday laws was still carried even by the Anglican Church. They still believed that on Sundays you shouldn't do any work. In London, that was the law. In England, that was the law. And then you remember very well that the Puritans who left England and they came to the new land, the new land America, they came with the same concept of Sunday laws, that on Sundays people are not supposed to work. The Sabbath truth was not clearly revealed to them. It came later on by the Seventh-day Baptist, as uh, we know based on our history. But when they came here, they came and enacted the same blue laws that were coming from England. They came with the same blue laws. And there's a reason why I want us to go through these blue laws. Uh, you will learn that as we study together this morning. This was America's first Sunday law. It reads, every man and woman shall repair in the morning to the divine service and sermons preached upon on the Sabbath day, that is Sunday. In other words, you had no choice. On Sabbath or Sunday, they are, they are Sabbath, the full Sabbath, you needed to go to church on Sunday, whether you liked it or not. And in the afternoon to divine service. It wasn't only worship on one in the morning, also in the afternoon. And catechizing or preaching upon paying for the first fall to lose their provision uh, and the allowance for the whole week following. For the second, to lose the said allowance and also to be whipped. For the third, to suffer death. In other words, if you miss the first Sunday, you're going to lose your allowance for the week. If you're employed by someone, you are not allowed, they were not allowed to pay you because you missed your first Sunday. And if you miss the second Sunday, you got a whipping and you also missed your allowance. And if you miss the third Sunday, then you were to be killed. Very, very interesting. America's first Sunday law. This one was in Massachusetts, Sunday law of 1650. It says, Further be it enacted that whosoever shall profane the Lord's day by doing any civil work or any such like abuses shall forfeit for every such default 10 shillings or be whipped. So you had to pay 10 shillings or be whipped. And some of these blue laws that we find here uh, ended up leading to Adventist persecution uh, in the early 1800s, in the late 1800s, and the early 1900s in our history. This one was the California Penal Code, Section 300. It said, every person who keeps open on Sundays any store, workshop, bar, saloon, banking house, or place of business for the purpose of transacting businesses therein is punishable by a fine not less than $5 or more than $50. This penal code of California uh, was implemented and it was rigorously enforced uh, in the Adventist history around about the 1870s. In the 1870s, there was a Sunday movement that began in America and California and in other southern states. They were pushing for Sunday laws. And uh, they resurrected the Sunday blue laws and started enacting them and um, rather enforcing them in California. As a result of that, Adventists ended up going through persecution as a result of these laws. Uh, W.C. White, William C. White, who was Ellen White's son, uh, was actually charged as having violated the law when he was running a printing press on Sunday in Oakland, California. And it was this law that was used. Remember the law said that you could not run anything for the purposes of business on Sunday. And uh, he was running a printing house and um, they basically uh, charged him and he was supposed to pay the money. And some of the Seventh-day Adventists refused to pay the money and they ended up in jail. And in 1883, this law, the California uh, Section 300 law was repealed if you study the history of Sunday laws. And during this time, not only in California, but in other states, in the southern states more precisely, Tennessee and other states, uh, you had Seventh-day Adventists going through persecution. You had more than 100 Seventh-day Adventists being persecuted for violating Sunday laws in the late 1800s. And more than 30 Seventh-day Adventists worldwide were persecuted, some of them in London, England. They were persecuted for violating this Sunday blue laws. And what was very interesting is how 
this clash between Seventh-day Adventists and Zealous Sunday Keepers came about. And um, I'll give you just one example of a couple that had a very horrifying story that happened to them. Uh, this couple stayed out in the country and they had their neighbors uh, miles away from them. They had a beautiful garden that they kept. They had a beautiful farmhouse that they kept. And they stayed beautifully and comfortably there. It was a young couple that had just gotten married and they went to settle there. It was in California, I believe. Um, and uh, as they stayed there, this law in California started affecting them. They had a little boy that uh, they gave birth to a little boy and everything happened to be fine until the neighbor went to report them to the police and said that they were disturbing her worship. So the sheriffs came and they asked her, do you worship on Sunday? He said, yes. I mean, do you work on Sunday? He said, yes, because I have to take care of my family. And the fourth commandment says, thou shalt, six days shalt thou labor. On Sabbath, I keep the Sabbath day, and on Sunday, I work. So they arrested him, took him to jail, and demanded that he should pay $50 or go to prison. So in protest, they said, I am not going to pay $50, I'm going to jail. So he went to jail, and after he went to jail, his wife and the little boy suffered a lot because there was no father at home, and there was a lot of things that happened. But cut the long story short, Unfortunately, their son died. And then, this man stayed in jail for a long time. The moment he came out of jail, he met people, a funeral procession, going to bury his wife. It was a very, very sad story. And A.T. Jones recounts this story in the book, um, National Sunday Law. And it says this man lay crying between the graves of his son and his wife. He just lay between them. Actually, it was in the state of Arkansas. Um, it, that, that was the state, not, not California, I'm sorry. So this Sunday laws really, really persecuted Christians. There was a lot of suffering that happened in the Adventist church as a result of them. Um, so if you read, many more Adventists in Tennessee were convicted of as Sunday law violators placed in chain gangs and subjected to hard labor, some of them. One early 20th century author counted over 170 Adventists in the United States and about 13 foreign countries who were persecuted, who were prosecuted to work to, for quiet work performed on the first day of the week, resulting in fines and costs amounting to 2,000 269 and 69 cents, $2,000, um, and imprisonments total into 1,438 days and 455 days served in chain gangs. So this was a very big issue in the history of our church uh, that was happening during this time, which led to a question that uh, was being discussed heavily in the Adventist church. Should people living in states that require them not to work on Sunday work? on Sunday. In other words, does working on Sunday constitute receiving the mark of the beast? When the law says you should not work on Sunday, should you comply with the law? Or when you comply with the law, are you violating the Christian principle? Others in our church argued that the fourth commandment said, six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. It's a command to work. So if it's a command to work, we must work on Sunday against the law. Well, the other side said, no, but that commandment is not really saying that you cannot have one day of rest in the week other than the Sabbath. In other words, if you spend the whole day resting, are you violating the fourth commandment? Is it a violation of the principle of the fourth commandment? So this issue was debated and it was discussed heavily in the church until Ellen White was interviewed. And uh, you can find a complete interview, uh, some of it uh, in the book Selected Messages. I'll give you the references and also Testimonies, Volume 9. And this was the question pointed to Ellen White. 
Should not those in the southern field work on Sundays? Those who are in Tennessee and other places, should they not work on Sundays? And um, this is the answer that she gives. The original article is found in Review and Herald, April 6, 1911, paragraph 9. You can read the whole article. We are not to make efforts to teach the southern people to work on Sunday. That which some of our brethren have written upon this point is not based upon right principles. When the practices of the people do not come in conflict with the law of God, you may conform to them. If the workers fail to do this, they will not only hinder their own work, but they will place stumbling blocks in the way of those whom they labor and hinder them from accepting the truth. Very, very interesting statement. She says we should not encourage people in the South or in states where the Sunday law says you should not work to work. By doing that, we are increasing unnecessary persecution. Uh, a very interesting statement. Another one, she says, I have given you the light which has been presented me, to me. If followed, it will change the course of many and will make them wise, cautious teachers. Refraining from work on Sunday is not receiving the mark of the beast. And where this will advance the interest of the work, it should be done. We should not go out of our way to work on Sunday. Very, very clear statement. Ellen White was very clear. We need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Working on Sunday is not accepting the mark of the beast. In other words, this state had a law that said you should respect Sunday, you should not work on Sunday, and she said here, refraining from work on Sunday is not receiving the mark of the beast. A very, very interesting statement. But what should we do in cases where we are not supposed to work? If the law comes here to Ohio that says you should not work on Sunday, if the United States enact a law at a uh, federal level that says that uh, you should work on Sunday uh, and not, you should not work on Sunday, what should you do? The counsel is very clear that refraining from work on Sunday in compliance with the law that says you should not work on Sunday is not receiving the mark of the beast. We can comply with that law and not be guilty of violating the principles of God. Then she says something very interesting. You find this in Revere and Herald, April 6, 1911, paragraph 9. She says, hold Sunday schools. This is the work that we are to do during this phase of the Sunday law. I told you that Sunday law has phases. The first phase is close business on Sunday. The second phase is do not do any work on Sunday or on a Sunday. And she says, during this phase, hold Sunday school. She says, on Sunday, there is the very best opportunity for those who are missionaries to hold what? Sunday schools and come to the people in the simple manner possible telling them of the love of Jesus for sinners and educating them in the scriptures. Conduct genuine missionary work. She says, after the Sabbath has been secretly observed in places where the opposition is so strong as to arouse persecution, if work is done on Sunday, let our brethren make that day an occasion to do genuine missionary work. Let them visit the sick and the poor, ministering to their wants. And they will find favorable opportunities to open the scriptures to individuals and to families. Thus, most profitable work can be done for the master. She said on Sundays, during that time, we need to go to people and open to them the Bible, show them that the law of God was not changed, show them what is the true Sabbath, and preach to them. We are not supposed to preach any compromise, but we are supposed to preach the truth during this time. So this Sunday law, blue laws that ended up leading to persecution of the Seventh-day Adventists during that time in the early 1800s, um, late, um, I, I mean, early 1900s, late 1800s, 
We find them now that the U.S. Supreme Court in 1961 said those Sunday laws are constitutional. In other words, you cannot use the Constitution to argue against the Sunday laws that you find in the states, the Sunday blue laws. Uh, in 1961, the U.S. Supreme Court issued an opinion that settled the question of the constitutionality of the state Sunday laws. Uh, the opinion came as a part of the decision made in a cluster of four cases from Maryland, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court was looking at four cases. The leading case among the four was uh, McGowan versus Maryland, 366 U.S. 420. This was 1961, which was brought by seven employees of a large department store prosecuted for selling merchandises on Sunday. And this is what uh, the conclusion was. The court ruled that Maryland's Sunday law did not violate either the religious clauses of the First Amendment or the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice L. Warren acknowledged that Sunday law in history originated with religious aims, but he insisted that these laws were no longer religious in character. He found contemporary Sunday laws to be completely secular statutes that apply equally to people of all regions. So they are basically saying that the current Sunday blue laws in America are constitutional. And uh, you cannot use the Constitution to argue against the Sunday laws because they view them as constitutional, because they are not, they, they view them as purely secular in their emphasis. And uh, I wanted to just say that about Sunday blue laws, and I'm going to come back to the stages of Sunday laws. And I wanted to highlight this. It's very interesting that when you look at the history of America, especially in relation to Sunday laws, um, this is what you notice. There's been so many push for Sunday laws from 1870s up to 1845. I mean, 1945, excuse me. There's been so much push for Sunday laws. I mean, out of the 142 religious laws, measures, 93 relate to Sunday observance. I mean, the majority of religious amendments that have been recommended to Congress had to do with Sunday observance. Do you think the American people want Sunday laws that they don't? They do. For them to be pushing so many times over decades, uh, decades for Sunday laws, it shows that they really are trying to push it. This is American State Papers on Freedom Religion, fourth edition revision, uh, revised edition. So as we noticed with the first Sunday law of Constantine 8321, it was a Sunday closing law. And then 8386, it was on a Sunday. And then 85, 425, it was worship on Sunday. And then you had the death decree in 538. We believe as we study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that the Sunday laws that are about to come will also follow the same faces, the same faces and stages that we have studied in history. And Ellen White attests to that, and the Bible also confirms that. The first, uh, these stages will be in this order. You have the economic stage, which is going to push for businesses to be closed on Sundays. Then you have the honor Sunday stage. Reverend Sunday, no work can be done even at your home on Sundays. Then you have the third stage that says worship on Sunday, and then you have the fourth stage that is the death decree that we find right here. So let's study the first stage and where we get that in the Bible. We know in the book of Revelation chapter 13, verse 14, something very, very interesting. The Bible speaking, Revelation 13 speaks about America, the second beast, we know that. And uh, I want, just want to highlight something about the image of the beast. You know that um, Ellen White is clear that when the leading churches in America, you know, come together, uniting upon such points that are common in them in doctrine, and then the state, in, I mean, finances them, sustains their institutions, and defends their dogmas, then Protestant America would have made an image to the beast. 
But what is the image of the beast? The beast is the papacy. And what is the unique characteristic of the papacy? Is their element of combination of church and state. And we find that also that in the image of the beast, there will be a movement to unite church and state. And how does this unity of church and state come about? It comes about the same way in which it came about with the papacy. The papacy was able to unite church and state by Sunday laws. Protestant America is going to make an image to the beast by Sunday laws. And we find that very clear. Revelation chapter 13 verse 14 it says, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. So just stop there for now. We see here that there will be miracles, and these miracles are going to lead the apostate Protestantism in America to push for the making of the image to the beast. How does this image to the beast be made? Is the first step towards uniting church and state. And we saw that in history, the first step that Constantine took to unite church and state in AD 321 was through a Sunday law, a Sunday business closing law. And I believe the same thing is going to happen during this time. And in Ellen White's time, there was a push for this to happen. You have the Blair Bill, the 51st Bill of uh, uh, Senator Blair, who was pushing for the Congress of the United States of America to enact a law that was forcing everyone to close businesses on Sunday. And even before that, we're looking at the state laws that currently exist. Uh, we have Sunday business closing laws in different states. And this is what Ellen White says about that. If they do this, there is danger that as soon as the opposing element can get the slightest opportunity, they will stir up one another to persecute whom they hate. At present, in other words, now, Sunday keeping is not the test. The time will come when men will not only forbid what? Sunday work, but they will try to force men to labor on the Sabbath and to subscribe to Sunday observance or forfeit their freedom and their lives. I want you to look at the bold portion of the statement. She says, at present, Sunday keeping is not the test. At what time was she saying that? It was at the time when man had forbidden Sunday work. In other words, it was during the first stage of the Sunday law, when they were saying you cannot work on Sunday. She says, during that stage of the Sunday law, Sunday keeping is not the test. She says it will become the test when they force you to work on Sabbath. So she's making a distinction between the Sunday closing law and the Sunday worship law that we have been looking at together. So here we find the second stage. The first stage is make the image of the beast. Then the second stage, if you read Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says, and he had power to give life to the image of the beast. So you find that there's a time when the image of the beast is made, make an image of the beast. Then there's a time when the image of the beast is given power, life given to the image of the beast. It is like they make this lifeless image then they empower this image with life to be able to speak. And we know that a nation speaks by its laws. So here we find something very interesting. You find that the image of the beast is given life. I believe this applies to the second stage of the image of the beast, which is going to cause people now to reverence Sunday. At this time, you could not do anything on Sunday, and that will be legal. You cannot do any kind of work on Sunday. And in Europe, I'll show you in the next presentation, uh, Europe is slowly moving into this part of Sunday laws. I have a friend who stays in Germany. She's German. Uh, she's married in South America. And one time when I was teaching Bible classes there, she told me that I just recently came from Europe. And now in Germany, in certain states in Germany, you are not allowed to mow your lawn on Sunday. You are not allowed to do your laundry on Sunday. Businesses are closed on Sunday. Now, the question that we have is, how 
should people who now live in Germany, in Austria, and in other European countries where the Sunday law, or Italy, where Sunday laws are strictly being enforced, who are Seventh-day Adventists, what should they be doing on Sunday? Should they still work on Sunday? We have seen this. If you want a detailed explanation of the work that can be done in those countries where persecution has started as a result of the first and second stage of Sunday laws, Ellen White gives that in detail in the book Testimonies to the Church, volume 9, page 232 to 235. It is entitled Sunday Labor. She, I believe those councils are very important and they are applicable to us. They give activities that can be done during this stage of Sunday law during the first and the second stage of Sunday laws. And then we're going to now discover the third stage of Sunday laws. And as we are moving there, this is what Ellen White said is going to happen. Great Controversy, page 589 to 590. Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. He will bring disease and disaster until popular cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Just this week you have had the earthquake that came in Japan. Uh, some of the people said it was a 7.4 on the Richter scale. Others said it was a 6.9 on the Richter scale. There were several uh, estimates that about that particular earthquake. Uh, even now he's at work, say, in accidents, in calamities by, la by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes, and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. Why is Satan so busy? These visitations, Ellen White tells us, are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon man and beast. Men and beast will be the ones that will be destroyed during this time. Where is this all going? Why is Satan so busy doing this? Maranatha 176, paragraph 1. Property and life are destroyed by fire and flood. Satan resolves to charge this upon those who refuse to bow to the idol which he has set up. Now listen attentively to this statement. It says, Satan resolves to charge these upon those, uh, those who refuse to bow to the idol that he will set up or he has set up. He has set up. So there has to be an idol that Satan has set up and this natural disaster has increased, and people are refusing to worship that idol. So what is that idol? His agents point to Seventh-day Adventists as the cause of trouble. These people stand out in defiance of the law. So this idol was set up by a law. Very clear in the statement. They say they desecrate what? Sunday. In the statement, the idol is Sunday. So these people have tried to force you not to work on Sunday, and you are not working on Sunday, you are complying with the law, but they still are not happy. And as natural disasters increase, they blame the saints for it. And they say, these are the ones that are causing trouble. And they, this is the solution they are bringing. Where they compel to obey the law for Sunday observance, there would be a cessation of this terrible judgment. If they were to be forced to comply with observance to the Sunday law, then these natural disasters will stop. All this is going to lead to the third phase of the Sunday law. Satan puts his interpretation upon events and they leading men think as there he would have them. That the calamities which fill the land are a result of what? Sunday breaking. Thinking to appease the wrath of God, these influential men make laws enforcing what? Sunday observance. So the third phase of the Sunday law is going to come by popular demand because of natural disasters. 
which they are going to point at and say, God is not happy with us because we are not going all the way. And the politicians are going to yield to popular demand. They think that by exalting this false rest, they higher and still higher, compelling obedience to the Sunday law, the spurious Sabbath, they are doing God's service. Those who honor God by observing the true Sabbath are looked upon as disloyal to God when it is really those who disregard them who are themselves disloyal because they are trampling underfoot the Sabbath originated in Eden. Maranatha 176. The time is coming, my friends, when the whole world will be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. It is the purpose of Satan to cause them to be blotted from the earth in order that his supremacy of the world may not be disputed. Testimonies to Ministers, page 37. That's where we are going. That's where we are going. So this is the third stage of the Sunday law that we find in the Bible, which says, and the image of the beast was both given power to speak how does a nation speak? By its laws. So this unity of church and state that was enacted is now power to speak and to cause all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their uh, forehead. That's the picture that we have. Causes all to worship the beast in his image. So that's the picture that we get. So this is the third stage where laws are now enacted where people are caused to worship on Sunday. And Ellen White said, the time will come when men will not only forbid Sunday work, but they will try to force men to labor on the Sabbath and to subscribe to Sunday observance or forfeit their freedom and their lives. So that's the third stage of the Sunday law. I want to finish this by saying that uh, we are about to go through this crisis. And the question I ask myself is, am I ready for the crisis that's coming? I'm going to give you current events in the next presentation and show you uh, what is about to come up on this earth. Um, and she says, you know not where you may be called upon to give your witness of truth. Many will have to stand in legislative courts. Some will have to stand before kings and before the land of the earth to answer for their faith. Those who have only a superficial understanding of truth will not be able to clearly expound the scriptures and give definite reasons for their faith. She doesn't say may not. She says they will not be able. They will become confused and will not be workmen that need not to be ashamed. Let no one imagine that he has no need to study because he is not to preach in the sacred desk. You know not what God may require of you. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 217. It's very important, my friends, to prepare ourselves for what is coming. Um, men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. She says here, these were men who were once in the truth. These are Seventh-day Adventists. Many of pleasing address. Men who are very eloquent in their speech. They will be standing on the other side. They will become the bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the cause to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them. And by false reports and insinuations, stir the rulers against them. Great Controversy, page 608, paragraph 2. We are headed for the final clash that are we are about to go through. And I want to read this as I close. It says, Maranatha 195. Those who will live during the last days of this S history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. In the courts, injustice will prevail. The judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God. Because they know that their arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are answerable. They will say, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. Our law 
with them is supreme. Those who respect this human law will be favored, but those who will not bow to the idol Sabbath will have no favors shown them. We are headed for a clash between God's faithful people and Satan's faithful followers. What I was doing this morning is to give you an overview of Sunday law history. We have studied how the Sunday law developed in the time of Constantine, Sunday laws in the time of Ellen White, and what Ellen White says about Sunday laws in our time. We are about to enter this phases, and I'm going to share with you what is happening now in the next presentation with current events, the Sunday movements that are currently all over the world. There is movement for Sunday keeping all over the world, and they've made progressive steps. I mean, this year alone, there's been so much that has been done in relation to Sunday law. So you don't want to miss the next presentation uh, where we're going to look at Sunday laws and current events and how to prepare ourselves for what is coming. May God help us to stand when the Sunday law crisis breaks upon us at an overwhelming surprise. I want us to close our eyes for prayer. And I want all of us, those who are able to kneel, and those who want to say, Lord, prepare me for the coming crisis, please show by raising up your right hand as I pray. Father in heaven, the Sunday law, mark of the beast sermons we have preached for over a century, are now seeing, are about to be fulfilled. And we are asking for you to prepare us for a time of trouble such as never was that is about to hit this planet. We are seeing movements be made, and all these things, Lord, are supposed to be uh, warning uh, signs to us that the time of the end is right here at our finger doors, our doorsteps. May you help us, Lord, to be prepared for what is coming, to study the Bibles like we have never done before, to have memorized scripture, to be ready for what is coming. Abide with us and bless us. In Jesus' name I pray.